Any practitioners of the power nap listening this morning? <sighs> Let's hear it for power nappers. Any power nappers with me here today? But what about this? Have you ever felt guilty for taking a power nap? Just consider this pair of realities, these weird pair of realities in American society today. The Social Security Administration estimates that between 2004 and 2017, disability fraud and other kinds of fraud cost taxpayers $1.3 trillion, $1.3 trillion over those years. In other words, billions of dollars a year are lost through fraud, disability fraud. That, that's not talking about the legitimate payments to people who genuinely need it. It's talking about people who don't need it, who take it from the government anyway. It's what I call criminal laziness. But on the other hand, on the other hand, don't we all know people who, whose lives and whose families have been devastated by overwork, by workaholism, by people trying to work two or three or four jobs just to make ends meet and working themselves to the bone and, and so forth. So you have overwork on the one hand and criminal laziness on the other. That's a very unhealthy pair of realities in our society today. Scripture has a better pair. And that pair of realities is this. Wouldn't you like to live a life that had these two realities going back and forth, working heartily, working from the heart without coercion, nobody making you do it, working because you love the work and giving and serving for God on the one hand, and then on the other hand, also resting easily without guilt in God, working hard, heartily for God, resting easily in God back and forth as a healthy rhythm in life. That kind of rhythm, that kind of, of balance, that, that kind of pairing is, in life is better than courier and ives, bread and butter, hand in glove, even better than chocolate and peanut butter together. We're talking about resting easily in God and then working heartily for God. That becomes our life and it is a beautiful, healthy life. That's a beautiful pairing. There is such a life. It is a life, a lifestyle, a way of life that includes and is dominated by non-anxious grace. It's, it's, it's God's intention for us to live that kind of life, basically from birth to death and even beyond into the new heavens and earth. That's what he's looking for for us. And what we're looking at today are two practices that are fundamental, that are integral to that lifestyle that God has for us. Uh, we'll also look at the divine origins of these practices and their human heart. So first, the pair of practices that the scripture talks about that are fundamental, that are integral to this non-anxious life of working heartily for God and then resting easily in God without guilt, working without coercion, resting without guilt. That kind of life, the two uh, major pair of practices that go along with that life uh, that, that God has given us are Sabbath keeping and tithing. The, the Hebrew words are Shabbat and Maser. Maser matters, Shabbat matters, Sabbath keeping matters, tithing matters, giving and working matters, resting matters. You see, resting really does matter. Uh, the seventh day, Shabbat means the seventh, every seventh day, we stop and rest. And, and uh, Maser, tithing, first percentage giving, means the first percentage of everything we receive, uh, we get from God, we give back to God, the first percentage. It's a way of showing that everything comes from God. It's what it talks about in this passage from Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, it talks about Sabbath rest. But everything that we read about Sabbath here in Hebrews 4 could also be said about tithing. So let's look at Sabbath rest 
It says in verses 8 and 9, For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. And then verse 9, there remains then, he says, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. A Sabbath rest for the people of God. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. That word that gets translated Sabbath rest there in verse 9 is actually, it means Sabbath keeping, literally. And, and so there's the sense in which after we die and we go to heaven, we have this Sabbath rest uh, in, in, in God. But it, it, it's not just that we go to heaven and rest and stop and we just sit there and do nothing. <laughs> That's not the, the new heavens and the new earth. The new heavens and the new earth is, is a place and a reality where Sabbath keeping continues, where we continue this pairing of working heartily and giving and worshiping for God and then also resting in God. And, and, and that's, that's, that's a beautiful gift. So the pattern continues in the new heaven and earth. Uh, it means we simply take about one-seventh of our time, uh, taking one out of seven days to stop and honor God by resting. We're not God. God is, so we can rest. We admit that we're not God and that that's okay. And we're okay with that, so we, so we rest. And we find that there's even grace sometimes in doing nothing because we're not God. And, and that whole idea, that whole concept, that whole truth becomes sort of baked into our lives over the weeks and years, over and over and over again. We always stop, okay, I'm not God. I get to rest in God. That's a beautiful gift that God has given to us. It's not just some idea that got invented by some preacher a few years ago, and that's not a gimmick in order to meet a church budget. Uh, or it's, it's not an, uh, a, an idea that, oh, man, some, some Puritan uh, of long ago with, with a pinched face decided to do this in order to suck all the fun out of life. That's not what Sabbath keeping is about. That's not what tithing is about. It's, it's about kind of baking into life, stirring into the recipe of life, this reality, this truth that God is God and we're not, and that's okay. So we rest. That's Sabbath keeping. That's the Sabbath keeping part. But tithing is also something that God has provided for us. Tithing simply means giving the first 10% back to God. It, it also, just like Sabbath uh, indicates that God is God and we're not and we get to rest, tithing is, is, is this sense that God is the provider of everything, and we recognize that, so we get to give back to God, and that's a privilege to do so. Uh, it, that bakes that whole idea into life. It stirs it into the ingredients of, of, uh, of our lifetime. And so the tithing and Sabbath keeping, Shabbat and Maser, resting in God, giving for God, all of that gets baked into our lives like conjoined twins. It, it, it becomes part of, of our life. And that pairing, the giving for God, resting in God as a, as a discipline, as a practice, as a way of life, that's, that's better than honey and lemon. It's better than strawberries and cream. It's better than Bonnie and Clyde, even better than Cheech and Chong. It's just a good way to live. It's a gift that God has given to us. Tithing and Sabbath keeping are ancient, life-sustaining, life-affirming, life-enhancing spiritual practices that are actually rooted, as we've been suggesting, in the character of God. And that brings us to the second observation. So the, the practices of this non-anxious, working for God, resting in God kind of lifestyle, the, the practices are tithing and Sabbath keeping, but the the, the the divine origins of these practices are actually rest upon the character of God. Why would we practice these things? Uh, because God gives them to us, so we give. God gives. God is a giving, providing God. So we give and provide back to God and one another. God rests, so we rest. God gives, so we give back. God rests, so we rest with God. We, we, we see we're like God in some ways. We, we are made in the image of God, imago Dei. We are sacred. 
we are told to be holy as God is holy, but also we are not God. We are weak. We are limited. We are sinful. And, and, and we need uh, God and what God provides. Sabbath keeping and tithing reminds us of that as a way of life. It builds it into our lives. You see, God is separate and distinct from us. God is, is all-powerful. And when, we, when it comes to Sabbath keeping, God never gets weary. You see, God's resources never run out. We get exhausted and need to rest in order to recharge and, and, and renew. God doesn't need to do that, but God rests anyway. He rested on the seventh day, not because he was tired, not because God was exhausted, but because rest is just a good thing as part of life, as part of reality. And, and God rests in order that he might rest with us. God doesn't rest because he's weary. God rests with us in Sabbath because God is loving. God gives and rests because God is loving and wants us to recognize that okay, through these practices, and he wants to rest with us as we rest in him. So here, listen to verses 9 and 10 again with that, with that in view. It says, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Why would we do this? Why would we do tithing? Why would we do Sabbath keeping? Verse 10, for anyone who enters God's rest and works for God and rests in God, anyone who does that also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. We practice Sabbath, we practice tithing, we do first percentage giving, we, we take time out just to do nothing and, and be still before God because God wants us to and it's the most healthy way to live. We get to work for God and be fulfilled in that and we get to rest in God and do that in a non-guilty, non-anxious way. What a gift God has given to us in, in, in these gifts. You see, uh, Annie Johnson Flint knew this truth well. She knew this lifestyle well. She, she lived a life that was full of pain, chronic pain, unfortunately, and yet she was able to, to continue to do these practices even though she was confined to a wheelchair during much of her adult life. She had to spend, because she had arthritis, that was a de debilitating uh, case of arthritis. She had to live in what was called a sanitarium. They had those in, in the earlier part of last century. And it was, it, in many ways, it was a, a negative kind of, kind of place, and yet she made it very positive. She did what she could. She couldn't work her, her teaching job. She did teach for a while, but then she wasn't able to do that. But she did what she could. And she was a writer, and she expressed this non-anxious, grace-filled living where we rest in God and work for God as much as we can, and back and forth in this pairing of life. And, and at one point, she wrote this, God has not promised smooth roads and wide, swift, easy travel needing no guide, never a mountain rocky and steep, never a river turbid and deep, but God has promised, she writes, strength for the day, rest for the labor, light for the way, grace for the trials, help from above, unfailing sympathy, undying love. We give because God first gives to us and we, we're limited, but we, we, so we give a percentage back, but we give the first percentage back to him. We rest because we're limited and weak, but we rest because God has given us the gift of being able to rest, not only to, to recharge and, and, and renew, but we get to rest in him and understand that God is good and God is loving. So we give and we rest. We give without coercion. We rest without guilt. What a gift that is. Andy Johnson Flint uh, knew, knew that very well. But we note one final thing, though, in this passage in Hebrews 4. Uh, Sabbath keeping and tithing, they, they ha they're rooted in the character of God, but they also have a human heart. Uh, and that's what it talks about in verse 11. And verse 11 is kind of a warning, but 
you can and you and I can take from it a positive application. Verse 11 says this, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fail by following their example of disobedience. Okay, their example of disobedience, what is he talking about there? What he's talking about there are the people in Joshua's day. And back up in verses two through eight, uh, the writer of Hebrews talks about their, their experience, and I hope you'll, you'll read that. But basically, when you read verses 2 through 8, what, what you get is, is this attitude, this heart that, that you want to avoid. What we don't want uh, is what is described in verses 2 through 8, which is uh, uh, an unbelieving, disobedient, hard-heartedness before God. And, and the, the, the urging of the writer of Hebrews here is through Sabbath keeping and things like tithing and a whole life, what you want to do is, is to have this, this believing, obedient, soft-heartedness before God. That's what we really, that's what we really want. And the question can be asked, okay, in, in Sabbath keeping and in tithing and in all of life, how do we go off the rails from this human heart that God wants for us of, of believing, obedient, soft-heartedness, a soft heart before God? How do we go off the rails when it comes to tithing and Sabbath keeping uh, there and, and move into this sort of ugly, uh, disobedient, unbelieving, hard-heartedness before God? Well, two ways. One is through legalism, and the other is through laziness. Legalism is where we ignore God, but we try to do the practices. We, 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 we take the soft-heartedness out of it. We, we take the, the God's love out of it, and we just make it a, a hard thing and, and, and compare ourselves with others and talk about how, how you ought to do this and you ought to do that, and if you don't do that, you should feel ashamed of yourself, and we add rules to, to the Sabbath keeping, and we add rules to the giving, that aren't really in scripture and, and we and do that. And that's what Jesus called the religious leaders of his day on the carpet for, for doing that, that kind, of, kind of thing. And when you add these extra rules to it and you make it uh, the kind of thing where you're not okay with me unless you do this and this and this and this and, and, and you try to manipulate people, it sucks the life out, out of the gifts and of the people who are trying to do it. And most people say, you know, I, I don't want any part of that. I don't want any part of that stuff. And Jesus got down on the religious leaders of his day for doing that. But then there's also, we go off the rails of this soft-heartedness before God through laziness, simple, old-fashioned laziness. And so sometimes what we're tempted to do is to say, okay, when it comes to tithing and Sabbath keeping, some people make up all these rules and they make it legalistic and, and hard-hearted and stupid. So I guess that means I don't have to worry about those things. I don't have to do those things. I don't have to practice those things. They're old. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, can just, I can just relax and not worry about them and not do them. You know, uh, people are so mean and ugly, I guess I'm off the hook. But here, here's the thing. Just a, a challenging, challenging question challenging way to think of this, in, in a good challenging way, you know, Jesus never said, hey, tithing is a stupid thing, you shouldn't do that. Jesus never said that. Jesus, even though he criticized the way they were trying to keep Sabbath and putting burdens on people, he never said keeping Sabbath is a stupid thing to do. In fact, Jesus kept the Sabbath. He took time out and rested. Just, just to rest in God's presence and to rest in God as a, all the time and in one sense, but then he also spent time doing that. He, he practiced Sabbath. And in Matthew 23, 23, Jesus says about all these disciplines, Sabbath keeping and tithing and all of the disciplines what, and spiritual practices, he says about them, you need to do them. You don't need to take them away. You need to do them with the right heart. What kind of heart? What kind of human heart do we need to, to, to do to keep practicing Sabbath and, and to keep practicing tithing with? What kind of heart? A believing, obedient, soft heart before God. That's the heart that we do these things in.
And when we get that, Andy Johnson Flint got it, and when we get it, the result is we give and we give and, uh, and we work all the way up to the end. Even though our work and our giving changes uh, from one span of life, from one part of life to the, to the end, ending of our earthly lives, we're still giving and serving in some way, all the way to the end. And we get to rest and enjoy life from the beginning. We get to rest and enjoy life from the beginning. Even when the circumstances are lousy, we get to rest and enjoy life from the beginning when we receive the grace of God. We get to live it out as a lifestyle, always working for God, but always taking time to rest in God. Sabbath keeping, tithing are the foundational practices of that life, and they are gifts. They are wonderful. I had a, a, a friend who used to tell me about his grandfather, and I've mentioned this before. His, his grandfather, in the later years of his life, had lost most of his hearing, and and I know a little bit about what that's like, but it was even worse for my friend's grandfather. He couldn't really hear at all, functionally. And, and he had uh, you know, pain. It was difficult for him to sit for long periods of time. And, and um, it was difficult to walk. And yet, every Sunday that he could be there, he would show up uh, and, and go to worship services. He would attend church. And over and over again, so many people in his life, family members and friends, they would say to him, Papa, uh, Mr. So-and-so, why do you go to church? You can't possibly hear anything. You can't get anything out of it. Why do you go? And over and over again, very patiently, very loving, from a loving conviction, my friend's grandfather would always respond, I don't go to church to get something out of it. I go to show whose side I'm on. I have a very loving, challenging, beautiful question to ask myself and, and all of us today, and that is this. What does the way that we worship, give, and rest say about whose side we're on? You see, there is this life a lifestyle, a way of life, of non-anxious grace, where we're working and giving for God and resting in God. It, it's really not simply about uh, power naps and bank accounts per se, although they're all included in that. The question is, whose side are we on? In whose grace and love are we living? Annie Johnson Flint also put it this way, when we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's forgiving has only begun. His love has no limits, his grace has no measure, his power no boundary known unto women and men, for out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he gives and gives and gives again. Whew. That sure beats a power nap. <laughs> I, I don't know about you, but in, in giving, in resting, and in all of life, I just want to be on his side. Won't you join me? Let us pray. Oh, gracious, giving, loving, resting God. I, I, just, I just want so much for all those listening to me today to be able to live out that giving, resting, maser, Shabbat, keeping life not just now uh, over the next few days and weeks and years, but even forever with you resting so peacefully in you and giving heartily and worshiping you always. May that be so for everyone hearing me today. Oh Lord, make it so. In Jesus' name, amen.